We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I am going, we have a, you know, a few attendees. I'm going to unmute everybody. Um, and just, uh, if you guys have some questions, um, please go ahead and ask us. Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Satvan Kosak. I'm a solutions engineer with F5 working on the federal team. Um, today, we're going to, uh, well, let's take a look at our agenda. So we're going to cover prop protection. First, we're going to take a look at our previous talk topic. Uh, the solution, we'll have a short survey that helps us kind of target these meetings and then what we'll be covering next and then we'll go to a live demo. I'm trying to keep the PowerPoints down um, to a minimum, really just trying to build the vocabulary of what we're used. That way when we go into the demo, it makes more sense. But um, like I said, I'll try to keep those to a minimum. Uh, one other thing, guy, everyone, uh, for those who just joined, we I did unmute everyone, so please go unmute. If you've got questions, so just uh, please interject. We've uh, kind of got a smaller audience today, so I thought it'd be a good idea to uh, allow you guys to ask questions. So if you've got questions, you know, go through the Q&A or you can, uh, you know, unmute yourself and, and ask a question. So without further ado, go ahead, Saad. So our previous topics, um, automating big IP and a multi cloud cloud environments with big IQ and the big IQ automation cases, including uh, AS3 declarative interface. Uh, big IQ now allows you to take an existing configuration and convert that into AS3, which is our declarative language based on YAML. Um, it's pretty easy to use. It really creates that infrastructure as code and it gives you a good step in stone into automating your big IP environment. And once you do that, that allows you to put that big IP environment into your CDI, CICD pipeline. Our other previous topic was advanced WAF versus ASM and the benefits of advanced WAF uh, versus ASM. And last week we had a meeting about OWASP top 10 compliance with advanced WAF. Advanced WAF now has um, guided configurations which allows you to easily create an OWASP top 10 compliance. It kind of shows you how deep you can go to meet that different compliance and it gives you a good report of your virtual servers on how they're meeting those com that compliance. So why bot detection and bot mi mitigation even more important, important? Well, most websites are heavily visited by bots. Uh, some of those bots are good, like search engine scrapers, uh, bots that update your news feeds, but they're also the hedgemen of not nice people, let's put it that way. Uh, they can steal mm -hmm. intellectual property. Uh, even just kids playing around can mess up your logs. They can uh, use up resources, especially if you're in a cloud environment. Uh, anytime that someone is crawling, that costs you money, right? So here's a little list of security risks from businesses. Uh, they can steal your information. They can attack websites. Uh, most web attacks actually originate from botnets. <clears throat> so this few, uh, affects you both in, uh, in business sense and affects you uh, in a deployment sense. So we can kind of categorize this, you know, business risk, we're talking about bad log, bad log and site metric, intellectual theft, web fraud, ad fat, fraud, <laughs> excuse me, a little tongue tied this morning. Um, availability risk, denial of service, denial of inventory, infrastructure cost incursion, and that's even more pronounced in, in cloud in de deployments. And once you have something in the cloud, it's gonna get scanned and all the script kitties and low hanging fruit is gonna target you. So that's one of the things that I like about bot detection is that by enabling bot detection, you're no longer the lowest hanging fruit. So things like uh, vulnerability scanning, vulnerability footprinting and reconnaissance, that's all generally done by automation. Uh, if you remove their ability to do that by automated scripts, they now have to do it by hand. And that increases the sophistication 
and increases their expense. So that's really a strong reason to do it. And in the back end, it's one of the few security controls that you have that enables you to uh, actually increase performance on your backend servers. Generally, you deploy security controls and it's gonna cost you performance. This is one of the few things that it's actually gonna alleviate uh, your backend servers to actually work better, faster, uh, with less um, hindrance. You. And here's the OWASP top 20 automated threats. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about this, but this is the stuff that you, you expect, you know, denial of service, footprinting, spamming, denial of service, snipping. So if you have any specific questions about this, uh, you can reach out to us now or later, uh, and we can talk a little bit more about it. So be before I continue, any questions so far? Yeah, and for those of you who just joined, uh, I did uh, allow talking uh, for this webinar, so we've got a little smaller crowd than normal. Um, so if you guys have some questions, just please, you know, you can interject uh, either through the Q and A or or chime in uh, via via voice. I, I get it. I do have a question: Is are any of you uh, concerned with any of these? Um, top 20 automated threats? Are there some things that you are, I mean, obviously you don't want any of this to be happening, but are there some that you are more focused on than others or some that you're looking to maybe mitigate with F5 or with another product? Okay, so since uh, we don't have any commentary, I'll go ahead and continue. So for solution, we provide a unified bot protection. Um, depending on which metric you use, somewhere up to 50% of internet traffic comes from bot. Somewhere 30% overall, but that's really gonna be dependent on your page. So if you have a high value, so if you um, have accounts that have credit card information or gift card information or intellectual property uh, log on pages, that malicious traffic can actually be much, much higher. Uh, so what we do is provide a, a block for attackers, for bots using advanced WAP, allowing legitimate users to come through. Uh, so here's a high level workflow the first thing we're gonna do is detect and classify and put in a, in a category. We're gonna do a browser verification, make sure that it's a true browser, and that's something just using a user string to pretend to be a browser. Um, if we allow it, we can create a device ID. A device ID is a fingerprint that we can create. This allows us to monitor both to block, that way we're not blocking based on IP, Blocking based on IP is not really effective and it's a good way to create a denial of service attack on yourself. And we also have a mobile SDK, which lets uh, mobile uh, users know that they're not a bot and they can respond. The next part we go is to stateless anomalies, um, detections per request and stateful anomaly detection per session. And that brings us to the mitigation. So we have multiple mitigations that we can do. We can just create a log alert, which we call alarm. We can send a captcha. We can rate limit. So it's pretty common to take some categories and or some particular user agents and rate limit them. Uh, curl would be a good example. You may want to have access to curl, but there should be no reason that somebody's running thousands of curls attacks per second. So you can re limit that to like one or second or one every 10 seconds. Then we can block, create a TCP reset. We can send them to a honeypot page, which is gonna look like our default one. It just looks like a, a bad logon. Um, this allows the user, the, the point of this is the attacker is gonna keep trying. It won't know that it's being blocked. And that allows you to pick up more information about what methods uh, that um, malicious user is using and they're wasting more time and more resources instead of uh, trying to get new weapons to attack your web page with. 
and then we can redirect to a specific pool if you want. Uh, one of the strengths of our product is the reporting. So for each client report, you're gonna get bot name, class category, detected anomalies and signatures. Uh, we also group those into incidents so you can see those, uh, how the attacks group into an incident. We're gonna provide stats of um, you know, top IPs, what bots were involved, things of that nature. And then you can go and granularly look at each request. So just to summarize it, we have an initial check. Is this an existing session? And is this a known client? And we can know this by based on the device ID or the mobile SDK. Then we're gonna classify it. Um, as we mentioned before, kind of just repeating what I'm saying, <laughs> uh, because this, it's really at the strength of the engine, right? And then we're gonna validate that client based on capabilities. We do use um, for things that uh, don't get blocked based on a signature or by, based on being a bad browser. Um, we do issue, can issue a JavaScript challenge based on the response to that challenge, we may or may not create a device ID. We're gonna do a reverse DNS check, and then we proceed to um, verify the behavior and state. So now we're gonna verify the client behavior. We're gonna check for anomalies, check the behavior for microservices, et cetera, et cetera. And that brings us back to our perform our mitigations, which are based on our policy. And once we get into the demo, we'll, we'll take a closer look at those. And then that takes us to reporting. So here is how we classify. So we have trusted bots, untrusted bots, uh, and generally trusted bots are gonna be search engine bots. Um, there'll be different categories and you can move signatures from categories. You can also create your own custom signatures and you can create your own custom categories uh, and place those signatures in, in either an existing category or a uh, custom category. Then obviously we have uh, untrusted bots. Um, so these are things that we don't know. It could be um, a script, uh, Python script, HTT library, things of that nature. We have known malicious bots and automated threats. We have browsers. We also have suspicious browsers. These are browsers that don't meet all the criteria of being a known browser, but don't meet all the criteria of being a known bad browser. And then we have uh, mobile applications with or without the SDK. And then if it doesn't fit any of that, we have unknown. So this is kind of how we map to um, browsers. Uh, from class to category, so which signatures and what categories we use to detect them um, and to mitigate them. So for bot signatures, we use a snort-like detection rules, which allows um, and those to get updated regular with advanced WAF. Um, and you can create your own signatures for bots that you detect. Anomalies are heuristic that detect various bot behaviors, uh, things like a sort of headless browser, uh, how fast you're typing, things of that nature. And uh, stateless anomalies uh, detect, you know, typical behaviors of bots or sites, examples, invalid browser capability, multiple user agents, things of that nature. And then uh, we have stateful anomalies, which uh, detect typical dot behavior during a session and would use session ID, device ID, and source IP to kind of target that in. So rapid surfing, captcha bypass, web scraping, those are things that a regular user will not be doing. Um, one of the things that we'll look at and I try to point out is that when you are creating bot template, there's three different categories of uh, bot template. Um, and those are relaxed, uh, balanced, and strict. And this just kind of lets you know 
how you are doing this. And then we have one thing that's called DOS mitigation mode, which once we're creating a policy, we'll take a, a closer look at that. A little bit over, I mentioned device ID, uh, which is an important thing to know uh, when you're creating your policy, if that's something you want to track or not. And this device ID is not just used in bot detection. This is used by both ASM and advanced WAF uh, to keep track of, uh, of users. So we assign and retrieve ID for each instance of the browser or mobile device. Um, it's used for stateful anomalies. This is collected using the, uh, the JavaScript challenge and Antibot mobile SDK. And so based on fingerprinting, browser storage, and patent and fuzzy matching, that, uh, it's proprietary information. And so JavaScript can be used either before or after uh, access, depending on how secure you want to make uh, your authentication. Yeah, and that what uh, this kind of does, everyone, uh, and why it's so important in, uh, in bot protection and, and advanced WAF is this can, you know, kind of a use case would be, you know, if a user is using random IP addresses per request, we could catch that, right? We could say, okay, this is coming from the same device, even though it's different IP addresses. So, and also that could be correlated across multiple applications um, in addition. So, you know, that, that's the reason this is important device ID is we can, uh, you kind of come up with a, a unique ID on a per, you know, client request even if they're doing something different, uh, be something right. out of the norm. Well, for example, you could use one browser, the legitimate browser, come in, grab the cookies, and then with that same IP, steal the cookies, put them in an automated attack fashion. Uh, but with our technology, that would have a different device ID, uh, the automated attack versus the browser, even though it has the right cookies. That's a good point, yes. Uh, so we're going to take a look at the hardware, the OS being used, the browser being used, the network being used, and the actual user ID being used. Uh, we kind of mix all those to create um, a, um, the device ID. And so we're continuously collecting that. It is not a static, so as things change, IP address change. Things like MAC address can change if you're masquerading MAC addresses. We're going to keep track of that. I've mentioned a little bit about uh, mobile devices. So one of the things to keep in mind with mobile devices is that mobile native applications do not respond to JavaScript. So when we issue a JavaScript challenge, uh, if that is a native app mobile application, it won't respond. So there's two works around for this. One of them is to use the anti mobile SDK, uh, or and that uses authentication application uh, based on uh, pre-sync publishing certificate. And we use uh, AppDome. So there's no dev, dev requirement. You just simply use a wrapper uh, to you, um, and that is uh, enabled. A uh, device ID is collected and we can do additional human interaction check. We can also look to see if device is being rooted or for emulators being detected. And then we can also use a custom signature instead of the SDK, but that's uh, not as secure, but it bypasses having to uh, wrap your, your application. And then the last point I want to touch is we also protect uh, with microservices. Um, which this is becoming more and more important um, as um, we're going away from uh, monolithic application to microservices application. Uh, so microservice is a host name and a URL, and uh, we have specific settings for those. Kind of looks like this, so you can do the browser verification, the trusted, and then we have specific um, capabilities for each one. And we'll take a quick look at that when we're um, creating a policy. So we're going to have a survey. So if you could please fill out the survey, uh, it keeps these uh, being more meaningful for us. Um, so that way we can provide you with useful content 
instead of us just guessing what you may want to see. And so next topics. Um, one thing about bots is there's many levels of bot sophistication. And one of the dangers of bots is what we call retooling. So what will happen is uh, if you have a high value target, um, you'll, they'll start using tools. Those tools will stop working and they'll retool till they'll start finding something that's going to work. So um, unified bot detection in ASM and advanced WAF is great up to a point, but for truly uh, um, sophisticated attack instead of kind of nuisance bots, we really recommend shape because what shape does is continually looking at the attack vectors that those users are doing and continuously retools staying ahead of the curve. Uh, so once you implement shape, it's going to keep uh, that sophisticated retooling for your high value assets. So um, I highly uh, recommend to if bot detection is important to you for you to take a look at our next seminar uh, shape and stopping authorized access. Not only can it stop unauthorized access, but it can also remove um, can, uh, friction on limit legitimate users. So if you have limit legitimate users, you can use shape to go ahead and bring them in without putting things like CAPTCHAs or additional authentication steps that they may not need. So that's my plugin for Shape. Uh, the next series is really looking into cloud and autom automation. Uh, we're gonna start with um, architecture into, into AWS and then moving into using uh, automating big IP with Ansible Tower. Uh, then we're gonna move to automating big IP with Terraform and then um, uh, automating uh, access policy manager. So this is how we talk about uh, providing access to uh, login pages uh, and how you can automate that. And then for people that are, are moving from on-premise uh, virtual machines, uh, what is the best way to move that configuration from a virtual machine uh, on-premise to a cloud virtual machine? So please join us. Um, we have a lot of good content and please fill out the survey. Uh, we do have and, one question here. And uh, I will add about the intro to auto APM automation. That was a question that someone, or someone had suggested that topic via the, the survey. So we are uh, paying attention to the survey. We've been working on some uh, APM automation stuff. So we're gonna present that on 9.9. So, so anonymous can be answer. asked about how about across other big IPs. Uh, can you uh, unmute yourself and specify uh, what part of that? I didn't catch that earlier. And, I um, think their question is uh, the early question. Suddenly, uh, I answered this while you were uh, oh, okay. presenting. There was around device ID, and I believe the answer is you cannot share that among uh, big IPs today. But that is something that uh, uh, we've been looking at doing. Um, it's, it, yeah, it, it can be shared in, in an active, active, active configuration if you're using the same policy. Um, it cannot be shared uh, within uh, additional um, big IPs. Now to have, to do that, you do need to use big IQ um, to be able to share that configuration uh, between multiple big IQs. Uh, be, between multiple big IPs, but they need to be part of the same cluster. Uh, they cannot be independent clusters, but that is something we're looking to share uh, among uh, in the, uh, across multiple clusters. Yeah, and so that is something some that- There was shape, uh, stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, that's something, one of the strengths of shape is that it is collecting that information and it's even more advanced than what we do. And it collects that um, without capturing any I, uh, IPI information, and it creates a huge call catalog of known good users, known bad users. So stay tuned for next week, and uh, I'll give you much more about that. So here's, we have some free resources, um, free courses, a little bit about um, 
and I highly recommend taking a look at our free courses. Uh, also in uh, cloud.dots.f5, we have a bunch of labs that you can run through. Uh, the behavioral DOS capability on um, advanced WAF is really neat stuff. I highly recommend you take a look at it. Uh, threat campaigns. Um, when well, we're talking about uh, botnets, it really, uh, if you see something from a botnet, this is going to active botnets with criminal intent, we're going to have that information. So we can provide you a very low false positive near zero and provide really strong mitigation information. Um, then more information about Antibot mobile SDK and about DataSafe, which um, DataSafe allows you to encrypt on the fly. Uh, you log in page information. So it's a very powerful tool to secure your authentication. And then uh, finally, the walkthrough uh, demo here. And so now we'll go through um, the walkthrough. Uh, once again, please feel free to ask any questions and uh, we'll go through here. Give me one second while I um, change my screen. All right. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, I can see your UDF blueprint. All right. Oh, no, you should be. It's sharing the wrong one. Sorry about that. Can you see the big IP now? Big IP. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. All right. So uh, to keep things simple, I didn't put a bunch of policies. I didn't create a bunch of virtual servers. I have a our insecure application, which is one that you, we all know and love. Um, and um, we'll take a look. So it's a standard uh, virtual IP, I mean, <laughs> virtual server with port 443. Um, if we look at policies, uh, we can see all the, what security policies I have enabled. Um, Notice I don't have ASM or uh, advanced, uh, any advanced WAF policy enabled. I can enable those here. Um, IP intelligence, DOS protection profiles, all these are now separated, so including data safe. Um, I do have my log profile, which we'll take a quick look at. I have a bot log and log all requests. And then I have my insecure, bot, uh, insecure app bot profile here which I have enabled here. This allowed that I did that a little earlier. That way we have some events to take a look at uh, and it'll make our, um, our uh, demo a little bit more interesting. I, I would like to add here, I mean, this is an important point that's uh, kind of salient point he, he pointed out here is that uh, uh, you do not have to do WAF with bot defense. I can do bot defense and get all of the you know, benefits of bot defense, uh, reducing, you know, automated attacks and everything by just configuring that. And, and I can later on, uh, you know, WAF later on if I wanted to. I can also do this, and I'm sure so we'll go through this, um, you know, enable bot defense in transparent mode. There are some limitations there. Um, you don't get the full suite of capabilities because to, you know, to be, uh, to inject JavaScript and do some of the JavaScript stuff, you have to be, you know, can't be transparent. It's got to be able to inject. So, Something to think about there, but my point being is, you know, I can layer on bot defense or put on bot defense, uh, you know, my existing ASM policy, or I don't even have to be running ASM or my WAF policy at all. Absolutely. And once you do decide to run your WAF policy, uh, it's much easier to create uh, application learning if you're using uh, bot defense, because uh, you're not going to be getting these malicious users uh, messing up your logs. So you get much cleaner logs, which makes creating policy a lot easier if you're using uh, negative learning. So um, as we have a separate policy, we also have uh, different uh, profiles that we can create. So there are these profiles right here with a little castle thing. Those are um, pre-canned profiles. 
So we have bot defense, all these are in transparent mode, are on balance setting. And then we have um, um, the defense bef before generated, I, the device ID generated before access and after access. And then we have uh, the policy that I, I'm using. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you this so you can see uh, what I've done and then we'll quickly create one so you can see. So it looks pretty much like an ASM policy. Um, here's the profile template. Uh, you can click here and it's gonna give you additional information about this, about what relaxed mode, balanced mode and it is. And the help files here are, are always very, one big difference between the ASM policies and um, bot defense policies is signature staging, staging is disabled by default. So if you want to use that, if that's something you commonly use, uh, be aware of that uh, when you're creating your policy. And then am I going to redirect to pool and then my, um, my response blocking pages, do I go to default or, or custom? So here are my bot mitigation steps. Um, so what I'm going to do, which different class for trusted bots here, I have alarm, untrusted, I have a block, though you could decide to not block, you could do alarm or um, other, for suspicious browser here, I have alarm, for malicious bot, I'm going to block, and then for unknown, uh, I could do uh, none here, or I could do rate limit, that way uh, I'll keep them from doing too much damage, right? And that's a pretty uh, aggressive rate limit, one, one per second. Um, and you can do what, so I can also do things like uh, mitigate. So for example, I can add an exception. So um, let's say, um, let's take curl as an example. So curl right here um, is set to block, so I can add this. And instead of block, I can go to rate limit and I'm gonna limit my uh, curl to one per second. That way I can query, but I, I won't be bringing my, my server down. Yeah, and this is, you know, you know, I think this is somewhat obvious, but uh, this really allows you to have very granular control over how you're, I like to think we talk about bots, I like to think of it as non-human interaction with your site can look, right? So I may have some legitimate bots either externally, like Sot mentioned earlier, like a search bot, Google bot, Bing bot, but I also may have some really uh, legitimate uh, internal bots to my applications, right? That may be doing specific things, maybe doing scans or, or whatever, right? And I may not want to uh, interfere with them. So I can get very granular in how I want my bot traffic or how I want my alerts and blocking and everything look um, or behave in terms of automated traffic. Right. So Python scripts is another thing that administrators will, will often use. Yeah. Um, so a little bit about my microservice uh, protection. Um, so here's where you create the name, the service type, and these kind of map back to the uh, OWASP top uh, 20 for automated. Uh, then the host name, protected URL, which um, uh, enforcement mode are we gonna go to? And then we can use either profile default, transparent, and then if we're gonna allow a browser verification, and then uh, these are gonna uh, mitigate down. So browsers, are we gonna allow or disallow? Um, a little bit more about this. Normally browsers are always allowed, <laughs> but it could be a case that this is, a, this is a microservice, which you would not be expecting a browser to go into a microservice. So that's one of the reasons you might want to disallow a browser to go directly to a microservice. You would be expecting an API call at that point. And once again, uh, browser verification, device ID, um, and whether we're going to make that uh, challenges in transparent mode or not, 
a single page allowed. Then going back to mobile application SDK, uh, here are the different options that we have, um, uh, including things like, are you gonna allow rooted devices and emulators? And then <laughs> we, if you do not have uh, an anti-mobile SDK, you can create a signature here. And we'll take you through the signature creation. Then signature enforcement, as I mentioned, um, by default, we do not stage, but you can enable staging. You can also take a signature and allow it to stage. So, um, Now uh, you can see two signatures are now waiting for samples to stage versus um, uh, zero before. Or if I want to, I can go ahead and uh, um, enforce everything. And then I can always create a whitelist of what we have here. So that's the basis of creating uh, of, uh, of a policy. Uh, if you create one from scratch, basically the same thing. I uh, won't spend a lot of time here, but just uh, I'll give you a quick look at that. The only big difference that you're gonna see here is now you get to choose uh, what you want to do with uh, the profile template. And once again, if you forget all the options of that, you can go to here. Um, so let's take a look at uh, our events. Uh, so we provide two ways of looking at this, bot traffic and bot request. We're gonna go ahead and start at bot traffic, uh, which is not quite as granular, kind of provides uh, a whole site. So here um, I can see uh, what has happened uh, in the last hour. Uh, let's take a look at the last day or um, last week. Uh, and so this is going to show me my different virtual servers. Um, this is going to show me the different categories that I have. Um, if I click on one in particular, um, it's going to show me what I've seen here. Uh, HTTP library, browser masquerading, uh, browser automation, and suspicious types. Um, I've been hitting this a lot with automated tools. so. Um, HP library is curl, right? <laughs> uh, it's actually, it's a combination of curl and some Python scripts I was using. Okay. Uh, so it depends how some of the brow, uh, um, uh, Python scripts, uh, were showing up as browser automation, depending on what it was doing. So I had a Python script that was, uh, forging a logon script and the other ones were just showing H browsers, but we can take a quick, uh, a quick, a deeper look at that. So if I go here, I can now see uh, actual incidents. So instead of looking at each individual, I can look at this. So here's how I was talking about one of the Python requests using an HTTP library. And this is going to show me the incidents involved. And incidents have to do with the same uh, type of attacks coming, um, being used. And those can uh, have multiple IP addresses and multiple sessions ID. So if I go here, I'm gonna get the incident in detail. Uh, what happened to it? Uh, the mitigation um, uh, action. Um, was this a microservice, the bot profile, uh, top IP sources, right? Um, what country it came from, things of that nature. So now I can go back. Um, I can take a look at unknown bot classes. Here, for example, I have a malicious bot that was uh, browser masquerading. And once again, I can go here and take a look at where this is coming from, uh, the different events. So this is coming from multiple sources from multiple countries. Um, as you're probably aware of, you can also control using geolocation, which uh, countries are allowable 
and then uh, you can actually get down to even more granular region. And then we'll give you, uh, for example, the top uh, um, malicious sources. <laughs> um, so far, any questions regarding this? So here we can look at, um, I just, uh, a URL going to weblock. This is now being accepted because that's just a uh, Firefox, right? So that's being allowed in, it's fine. You probably might not even want alerting for this, to be honest, right? But here I'm trying to show you the different capabilities uh, we have, and here are the top six addresses uh, and incident requests. Um, yeah, and this, you know, guys, this, um, you know, gives you a really good idea of what's going on on your on your applications, right? Anything that's uh, traversing the big IP with with bot defense turned on gives you a really good idea of like how much automation do I have going to my site, and you know how much of this is legitimate automation, and how much of it is is illegitimate automation, and how much of it is you know normal human traffic. Um, so it gives you a really good idea of of kind of what that footprint looks like. Right. And so um, you can see here a malicious bot presenting itself as Firefox. Um, and so here we're looking at things like browser automation, browser. One of the things that we used to detect this was rapid keystrokes. There's no way um, that uh, you could type that fast and then requesting browser without the verification cookie. So you're st skipping a step. And that's one of the examples I used earlier of using the legitimate browser to get the cookie and then importing that cookie. So it's one of the reasons why device ID can be important. Um, and then uh, as always, we have really good filtering on this. So if I don't wanna look at everything, I can look at my last day. Uh, let's just take a look at uh, malicious bots, for example, and apply here. Um, and I can see my, my different uh, incidents I received in the past day. Uh, here, someone pretending to be Chrome, uh, actually using Cilium Web Driver, and this is browser automation. Specifically, this is a spider trying to crawl a website that got blocked. Um, and so at any point, you can come here and um, see what, what those are. And then once again, Here's giving me my sources and specific what happened to each one of those requests. So that's the most cohesive view of it. Then I can just go to my bot requests. If I just wanna see everything that's been happening, I can get kind of this generic view of everything that I have. Once again, I have basic and all detail. Uh, I can always uh, pop in a, a bigger view um, and then I can go in here. Once again, I have um, more information here. So I can see what's being challenged. I can look at through the virtual server. I can look at different profiles, uh, time periods, geolocation, support ID, any class, right? Um, so an interesting one is to look at suspicious browser and um, look at this because what will end up happening is uh, the suspicious browser will get a challenge. And if you actually look at the bot details on that, it ends up not passing that challenge because suspicious browsers get blocked, but you can see the challenge requests going here. So as these are coming in by date, you can actually see that progression happening. So any, any questions? This is really the, the meat of, um, of uh, the unified bot detection within uh, the ASM and advanced lab. Yeah, I uh, wanted to second the, the whole, the challenge with the browser. That's one of the more interesting ones to look at because you know if you have a, someone that's, or a client of any type uh, presenting itself as a certain browser, 
that's exactly what they want to look like, right? And if we can detect that that is someone uh, it may not be who they say they are, we want to challenge them. We want to provoke them and make sure they are who they say they are. So if they're a browser, they should be able to legitimately answer, you know, uh, a JavaScript, like a, a capture or something like that. And um, if it can't, then then you most likely know it's it's uh, it's not who it is. It's uh, something automated, right? And it's something it could be could be legitimate, it could be illegitimate, but it's not someone. It's not who they say they are. So here, um, actually, uh, you can see the follow up request. So here you have the request, right? And by clicking in the request details, then I can go here. And that's going to give you the additional information, but that's actually uh, the, the request and we can request the previous request. So you can see that progression. Uh, if I go to all details, we get even more information. And that once again, is a Cilium web driver trying to pretend to be Chrome. So I, I, that's one of the things I personally find, find pretty, pretty interesting. And here in this case, uh, we challenge and the follow-up request was actually a valid um, uh, request. So we challenge it and it passed. So um, one last thing I wanted to show, um, and then I will conclude our presentation. I'll answer here's uh, different uh, logs and what you can log, and um, you can set that logging profile per virtual server. Um, here, I'm just doing bot defense. I can create one that does everything. Do I wanna look at human users? Um, what type of bots? Uh, do I wanna see mitigation steps? Um, log requests by browser verification action. Uh, do I wanna see the log uh, device ID collected? and log challenge fail request, go and see. So it's pretty standard. Um, and depending on how you wanna do that, you can create either one log profile that rules them all, or you can break those down into specific different categories. And um, so that's pretty much unified bot defense in a nutshell. Um, if for some reason, um, uh, you didn't get a chance to ask questions, so you would like to see a more thorough demo or proof of concept in your own environment. We'd be happy to help you with that. Uh, so please reach out to us and uh, please fill out the survey so we can continue making um, these useful information. And don't forget uh, the shape um, next week. And that's really going to cover sophisticated bot attacks and bot network attacks next week.